Thank you so much. I think that that video is really representative of the conversation and the focus that we have here today. We are talking about cultural institutions and support of cultural diplomacy as it helps to spur global dialogue and faith in our inter international institutions, even at a time where we're seeing in so many places in the world the rise of nationalism that can sometimes limit us in our conversation. So we want to endorse that move toward a real support for cultural diplomacy and what it can mean. And I, I'm reminded of remarks made by uh, the great American historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. who told the stories of, of Abraham Lincoln in this very city at the height of the Civil War insisting that the Capitol Dome just down the road continue its construction in the midst of, of a civil war. And he said, no, this is important because the nation and our people must believe that the institution will go forward, that our culture and community will go forward, that our dome of the people would go forward. And FDR, in 1941, with the world at war, saying that he would, he referred to Abraham Lincoln's comments, and he said, as he introduced the National Galleries, that this too must be a foundation that we support. Right? the cultural values that we support of our nation. And John F. Kennedy, looking to both of those stories and saying, look, the reason I want to support a National Endowment of the Arts is for the very same reason, that we must continue, that this is the centerpiece of what we are as a nation. And this is our shared values, and this is what we indeed tell the world about ourselves and what we want to learn about the world. So with that in mind, we want to talk here about cultural institutions internally and externally, and what we as the United States present to the world and what the world gives back to us in the form of cultural diplomacy. And I want to begin with Mr. Baer, whose organization, Burson Marsteller, is active in more than 100 countries around the world, but also in your work leading the PBS, the Public Television Board in the United States, and with Discovery Networks as well in your past. You have this opportunity, frame for us this, the importance of these dialogues in keeping the communication going around the world. Well, uh, thank you, and thanks to all of you, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of this, and in particular, this discussion with uh, these other panelists. Uh, it's crucially important. Uh, and let me just say, if I might, uh, it's certainly important because it's the right thing to do, because it helps to sort of bring us together uh, as peoples around the world in a way that we believe ultimately will lead to greater peace and prosperity everywhere in the world. For us, it's important from a business standpoint also. Mm -hmm. uh, and to invoke the cliche, you know, we have to think globally and act locally and find the way to sort of bring those together. So we're in 130 countries around the world. Uh, and someone asked, how do you succeed? And I said, we work really hard. But aside from that, uh, you know, 70% of our business in those markets around the world is local. Mm -hmm. You know, 30% uh, it, uh, of it is global or international and multi, multi, multinational. And uh, we have to be able to be ingrained in those local cultures and to have talent, people, um, who are from those places and understand the business practices and the government practices and everything that's happening there and the cultural practices and be able to reflect that back uh, to the people with whom we work. Um, so it, all of this is important and feeds together. I would tell you that uh, from, it, we also uh, go out of our way to engage in pro bono work uh, that is designed to do precisely what we're talking about here, which is to sort of find ways to weave people together across the divides. And I, I think a great deal of culture is, is, it's one thing to talk about cultural institutions and, and art and cultural output, which is crucially important, but at the end of the day, it's about how do you touch the hearts of people and sort of, and, and their minds, and sort of bring them uh, to a higher level of understanding of what we have in common rather than what divides us. And so uh, we have three very big pro bono activities that we work on around the world, each of which in its way is designed to do precisely this. Uh, we work for Girls 20, uh, which is a, an organization that is, mirrors the G20 and is designed to uh, help to uh, drive the uh, uh, economic empowerment of, of women and girls around the world. We work for Seeds of Peace, 
which of course is a group that brings together young people um, uh, from conflict areas in the world so that they understand one another better and can go back out as seeds planted into their culture so that the, hopefully the, a, a spirit of, of coming together is able to, to grow. Uh, and we represent a Special Olympics uh, whose whole purpose is to uh, basically connect people across physical lines that might otherwise divide them uh, everywhere in the world through sport. Um, so I, to me, and again, I, I've seen this, my work at Discovery, uh, one of the things that I remember early on when I got there and I was proudest of that we did was a series called Watch with the World. So Discovery realized that it was in 180 countries around the world. It was the most widely distributed pay television platform in the world, still is today. And that we had the potential to do programming, nothing controversial or provocative, great programming about what was happening in the world. The first one we did was uh, on Cleopatra's palace that had sunk into the harbor of Alexandria Harbor in Egypt uh, and was being sort of excavated at that time. There was a great documentary done on it. But to be able to do that in prime time, so not simultaneously, but in prime time everywhere in the world. You know, with the idea that audiences everywhere in the world could experience this common cultural heritage. Uh, and obviously PBS, uh, interestingly, both imports and exports great culture from around the world as we know. And I think in the process of doing that, and we were talking earlier about something that's coming up that maybe Megan wants to speak about, in the process of doing that uh, is able, I think, to help people in this country uh, have a greater sense of their cultural bond and link with people in other parts of the world and vice versa to sort of share what we are at our best culturally with the rest of the world. That seems like a perfect moment for Inspire to step in. You, you lead the President's yeah, Commission. Thank you. And, and you have, yeah, he's actually teed you up here. I specialize talk. in these segues. <laughs> so good at it. So I'm Megan Byer. I'm the Executive Director of the President's Committee on uh, the Arts and the Humanities. And we took a trip to Cuba. And so I'm going to start, we have some photos and I'm going to sort of take you through that little trip. Because to me, you know, cultural diplomacy is like art. It's not transactional. It's not overt. It is um, a dance. It is a seduction. Or as the great diplomat Smokey Robinson would say, it's a love affair. <laughs> Just one month after President Obama made his eloquent Todos Somos Americanos speech in Havana, we arrived with the chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Jane Chu, the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Bro Adams, and the Smithsonian uh, chief, Dave Scorton, along with a virtual invasion of American artists. Some very famous faces here. Very famous faces. We had uh, ballet dancer Lourdes Lopez, violinist Joshua Bell, the inimitable Usher, the legendary Smokey Robinson, down and dirty Dave Matthews, opera singer Larissa Martinez, a Tony Award-winning Jersey boy, uh, John Lloyd Young. And while they had fun, we went to those meetings you just saw, very tightly scripted pomp and circumstance uh, kinds of meetings where we you know, hashed out seven deliverables we hoped that we'd be able to announce at the end of the trip. Meanwhile, our artists were out visiting barrios, teaching children in schools, visiting art institutes. The people went wild over them. They were interviewed by the press, they were embraced by the people, and Smokey Robinson had the best sound bite that was all over the papers. This is the beginning of a love relationship. <laughs> so all night, we feasted together. After those meetings, we'd come together with the artists and we'd have Cuban cuisine, we'd dance, we had mojitos, a few cigars were smoked, culminating always in music. And then every morning at those bilateral, those stiff bilateral meetings, we could tell that our Cuban counterparts had heard everything about what had happened the night before. There'd be that wink or that, you need another cup of coffee? Or a little pat on the back. And they loved the fact that we were dancing, singing, and getting to know everyone. The final night uh, was meant to be a concert by the Cuban artists, for our artists, from Santorini percussion groups to a rap group. But what happened was, by the end, they all knew each other so well that Dave Matthews, Smokey Robinson, Usher charged the stage. And they ended up dance, dancing and singing until, there's some photos of it here, uh, until 4 in the morning. And so the next day was our conclusion uh, at the Grand Teatro, where the president had made his big speech. Um, we sat as friends, exhausted. 
counted, about 80 Americans on one side, 100 Cubans on the other. And it really was a moment of triumph because we got to announce those seven deliverables we'd been hashing out in all those very stiff meetings. But it, at, at the end of it, our, and you know, none of these deliverables were earth shattering by any means, but they were a first step, you know, a first date. You know, we, we got some traction going with some government to government collaborations. So our chairman at the end said, we applaud the Cuban people. And you see here, our delegation just kind of spontaneously stood up. And what was so amazing was the Cubans, who if you know, you know, uh, governments like these <laughs> rarely do anything unscripted or not okayed. Uh, they all stood up and we would just sat there applauding each other. And I have to say, it felt like a beginning or as Smokey would say, it felt like the beginning of a love relationship. <laughs> So I think, you know, I wanted to take you on our little travelogue to, to let you see kind of, you know, what happens with cultural diplomacy. It's heart to heart, people to people. It's, it's this. It's what Gallup was tracking with all those numbers. People like Americans. They like our values. And you could, it was palpable on this trip. And similarly, it is the opportunity to know the other. I mean, you, we have a perception in the United States about Cuba, but it has been a closed perception for some time. Now, American artists as well have an opportunity to learn from the Cubans. Absolutely, and this is something they have invested in. Uh, and they were so, it, we could legitimately, authentically say to them in all those bilateral meetings, you do this so well. And, and our artists could say, I wish I'd had the opportunity at some of these art institutes. So, you know, there were moments for us to be humble, as every ambassador. Uh, you know, knows. You know, my husband served in Switzerland for four years, and I did a lot of our public diplomacy with uh, cultural institutions. And you know, that's that's what a relationship is: you give and you take. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador, that is the likely beginning to our conversation about this, because you, in your position, you're relatively new, and I might add, a little bit younger than some of All the others of us, of us here. <laughs> up here, but you've come to bring a new face of Afghanistan to the United States, and you're doing this in large part with that cultural diplomacy. Absolutely. Well, for, for a post-conflict country that we are, which is still struggling with bringing stability and peace to our country, culture is national security. Culture is prosperity, and culture is our global integration. Um, and I'll, I'll dig deep into each one of those. In Afghanistan, what we consider people who people who are criminal, I think it'd be difficult to translate. Uh, it's called non-culture, people who do not have a tradition, who are not tied to, to their surroundings, end up uh, being criminals, being the, 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 the people, the outlaws in the society, and they become um, vulnerable, vulnerable to, uh, uh, to, to terrorist groups and others. So it, for us, it's immediate national security. Culture, tradition is right away tied to that. Then it moves into a regional integration. There is such a thing as lost in cultural translation because you can translate something, it would mean exactly, it wouldn't be a literal translation, but if you don't understand the culture, it becomes extremely difficult to actually relay the very same information to the other side. And for us, in our global integration, for a country that was isolated for over 200 years, it's important that we have that cultural understanding, not just of other cultures enough to us, but also um, our um, making sure that people understand Afghanistan outside and why we dress and how we do things. Culture is beyond um, things that we, we take into account, whether it's language, all of the parts that make it into our identity, from, from the way we dress to the way we eat, to the way we react to um, emotional situations, how we treat uh, crises, all of that become our culture and how we, how we do it. And, and that, won't, that leads me into our prosperity part, is, is we're proud of the diversity in Afghanistan, the diversity of cultures, the diversity of ethnicities. And, and, and we learn a great deal from what the United States has been able to achieve from its own cultural diversity here. Um, one of the reasons, from, from my perspective, the success of the United States has been the diversity that brought in, the immigrants that, br that came in and brought their own cultures with them, and, and the, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the merging of the, the, the hard work 
that turned out to be the American dream. You come, you work hard, you can achieve anything you want to achieve. And that was the, the convergence of the different cultures that all the immigrants that came to the United States brought, which also means uh, the Afghan dream. It also means any other country's dream, which is equal opportunities for us to work hard in um, co um, uh, coordination with one another and respect for each other's um, di differences. Um, that leads us to peace and stability in our country. And for that reason, a big part of our work here in the United States is, is promoting both the Afghan culture, but also making sure that we Afghans understand what the, the cultures of our fundamental partner here are. Um, you have a relationship now with the Smithsonian. Yes. Um, and, and it's an interesting opportunity for anybody who has a chance to go and see it for your Sackler, the, yeah. the rebuilding, as it were, literally, of old Kabul. So most of the, the focus on Afghanistan is always on the war. Uh, and, and, and nobody looks into beyond that, because that's what gets covered on the mass media. It's, it, it makes headlines, so that's what it happens. But a country goes through more than just that, to, to be able to be where we are, like I said, to build institutions, to, to build an economy, um, for people to be able to have peaceful lives, a lot more than that happens, and a culture plays a big part of that. So the, um, outside of our uh, Ministry of Culture, there is, a, there is a quote, and it's not written by the government. Someone, um, it's, uh, someone scribbled it outside on the wall, and that we adopt it into. It says, um, a nation survives when its culture survives. So a culture has become the solace for a post-conflict country. It, it has the... It is what brings us together. It was, it was, it's what gives us the resilience to deal with the, the problems that we currently have. Um, over four decades of war can, can really shatter it, everything from uh, the human psyche to, to the food chains and all that. But what, what keeps us together to this day is, all, is that culture and that tradition that, uh, that takes us to the next step. You know, it really does remind me of the Abraham Lincoln quote that I mentioned earlier. It is what allows people to have faith in our institutions. Yeah. We must support this part of our shared history. Specifically, though, I do want you to, to mention the exhibit, the Turquoise Mountain yeah. exhibit. This is really a recreation yes. for, for people here, people in the West who do not have a vision of the great culture that exists in your history. If you haven't had a chance to visit, I, I would encourage you all to go to the Freer Sackler Museum uh, to see the Afghan exhibit. It's by one of the foundations called the Turquoise Mountain. Um, and, and that name, Turquoise Mountain, comes from an, um, a lost uh, capital of the Guri Empire that was in Afghanistan. Um, uh, it, it, it highlights and puts some of the handicrafts from Afghanistan, from pottery to jewelries, uh, making and, and carpet weaving. And, and some artisans are there live to talk to people um, to show you how far that goes. And, and what Turk has minded being able to do is revive an old part of the Kabul city completely um, for out of rubble. Um, and to, uh, to, to showcase what that part of the, the history was. It's a, it's, it's a new democracy. Afghanistan is a new country for the, in a, in, as a global world, but it is a very old country in terms of tradition and, and a past. And much of what we do is ingrained and enshrined into our past. And that museum kind of puts that on exhibit. Um, this exhibition puts that. Um, to, to be able to see the past of Afghanistan and what gives us hope to, to a better future. Mr. Baird, can you, can you speak to that and what that does for a nation as it tries to rebuild both its institutions and its image? Well, I think of all this in terms of people, right? Because at the end of the day, institutions are only the reflection of all of our people. And, and it, it, they are things that we invest um, our sense of common purpose in. And so I think that what culture does, and I, the same, by the way, is true in terms of its image abroad. It, we we're really talking about the image of the people, one by one, group by group, family by family, community by community. And to me, I think, as you've suggested, Ambassador, um, making sure that there's a strong sense of culture and what is shared more than what divides us um, is 
crucially important for people in particular when they are in a form of recovery uh, and trying to come back and remember what has been good, but also be able to translate that forward into where their future is going. The other thing that is almost universally true about cultures, no matter how diverse or undiverse our countries might be, they're, they're a mashup, right? Culture is not sort of one monolithic thing uh, in any country. I mean, look at this country. Um, ours is, you talk about us being a nation of immigrants. I mean, I, I don't know where you, it, it's a mosaic, right? It really, or a tapestry is maybe a better way to think about it. It's all woven together. And sure, you'll come to a part that looks a little different here than this part over here, but you can't appreciate the whole without looking at the whole and understanding it and then understanding the pieces. And that mashup is so crucially important. So I think that also helps any kind of culture and country that is feeling a need for recovery because you, we all have to understand um, that the culture is not one thing that we have to adopt and accept. It is many things that we have to wrap ourselves and in. And enshrine, you know, there was a conversation about Iran and the worry about changing the culture. Um, and I think that if you, I, I worry about American culture, you know. My kids don't understand the idea of America the way I grew up understanding this idea of America and this, you know, changing world that we're in. There's a uh, rejection of some of the institutions that were very strong when I grew up. So, um, you know, I do think it has to be a dynamic thing, uh, but I think there's a great example of a country that does put culture first and it, where they don't really have much else, and that is, that's what we took away from our trip to Cuba, that they put a lot of, of money and resources behind the arts and education, and meanwhile, people are making $20 a month. There's, you know, it's a... There are a lot of things that they don't have on Maslow's hierarchy of you know, shelter and food. And, but they've got, the, the government has been very strong about the culture and, and the investment in culture. And to see a country that has so little else, mm -hmm. and yet this investment in the culture has kept them together. But I mean, this is not it's true a, in all places or in all organizations for that matter. No. There isn't always complete support and faith no. that this is a worthwhile investment. What do you say when people say, look, you know, that, that's lovely, you and, and your paintings and your art and your dance and whatever, but we got people need to eat, yeah. you know? What, what do you say to that? What well, do you say when you, meant, the, the, the terrorist is. threat, things like that? We've got immediate concerns here. Well, those are the immediate concerns. That's what I said. We frame it in, in our national security. If our people are recruited, but, People who have identity crisis and are being recruited by terrorist groups, that is our national security. So it's, it's immediately uh, my concern to be, to be concerned with culture, with art. Um, it's also um, a, a factor into, um, into the economy, the getting to understand global. In, in this world of globalization, we're moving towards um, an, a lot of nationalism. We see it throughout the world, um, and it's because Traditions take centuries to form, but in this globalized world where technology is so much faster than tradition can catch up, we're seeing more individualism and we're seeing more fear, we're seeing more nationalism. Um, and, and cultural, the cultural work brings us back to catch up, to be able to bring us back to stability. The world would not be stable if we didn't catch up with well, tradition. I look at the Renaissance as being a period where this little printing press, you know, kind of reordered everything. And it was a, a time we would not wanted to have lived through because I think there was the same sense of fear of change. But if you look back at the Renaissance, you are blinded by the arts. And I think that what you're saying is that it's a guidepost. And you know, I see this next generation feeling a bit adrift. And the arts and our culture, you know, maybe we need to think about you know, putting them first as a way of getting through this, this very difficult time of change, just as happened during the Renaissance. You know, there, ha there has been this period we have seen the, the infliction by such groups as ISIL against cultural landmarks mm -hmm. through the world. It, it is a form of really cultural terrorism, is it Absolutely. not? I mean, it, it, it drives home the, we will destroy who you are as a people. Well, 
I just, I, yes, we have seen that. I just want to make sure that we don't leave here thinking of culture as history, right? Culture is present and it is, to your word, dynamic. It is changing. It is messy. And that's another thing that, that uh, forces uh, uh, that would seek to control people in their minds um, also don't understand and don't appreciate and are frightened by. And the fact that it's messy and changing, frankly, is frightening to all of us, right? And, and, but that's part, being able to live with that as a people collectively and individually is part of what uh, great culture sort of helps us to be able to appreciate and understand. We're all always in an evolution. Think about it. Uh, Usher was there with you. You know, 30 years ago, there was no hip hop, yeah. right? <laughs> 35 years ago. And I mean, think about the, the essential nature of that part of our culture now today. Think about where we are today, 24 hours ago, right? Perhaps the most uh, essential, authentic voice of the American heartland of our generation, Bob Dylan, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, and what he represents, and really in some respects, what he's a pipeline for in terms of the voices that he represents from our culture. Uh, it's, it's unimaginable, almost, that... Uh, I think there are a lot of novelists who feel that it's still unimaginable today, right, but... Right, well, maybe they'll have their day, but you know. Um, but you know, I mean, I just think it's, it's all constantly changing and evolving, and we have to be able to embrace that, too. And I love what the ambassador said about this being an immediate national security issue. The president says the, the arts are our soul. You know, and, and I did palpably feel this in Switzerland and in Cuba, that you know, when you looked at those numbers from Gallup you know, in 2008, um, when we arrived in Switzerland in 2009, you know, there were a lot of policies that the Swiss didn't like you know, in the land of the Geneva Convention and you know, Guantanamo and all these things, and watching glaciers recede, and we were redacting global warming out of documents during that period. You know, that explains a lot of those, the dip in the number. But they still liked us as people because they were still going to the Montreux Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. listening to our music, going to the Locarno Film Festival. It was always our music's winning. Art Basel, um, you know, they loved our culture. And to look at it as such an imperative as you do, clearly, as a, a security imperative, I think that's absolutely the right lens. It's not an extra. Mr. Minister, just a last thought from you about the value, the importance of maintaining and growing your current culture. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Baer said we don't want to go out of here thinking that a culture is just history, but it's, um, uh, it's our present. And it's also the details that you mentioned. If you want to look at the whole picture, you go into the details that makes it colorful. That completely, but it also brings us, bridges us with the rest of the, uh, the the world community. Through culture, through arts, we find similarities. It's we may do things differently, but we do it differently because the circumstances that make us, that are around us, our environment around us, make us do those things differently. But we all do that because it's a necessity for living our lives. Through culture, through art, we come together and find those similarities. And that's when we start to notice when it's in humanity, there are more commonalities than there are things that divide us. And we all can learn from that. I thank you all very much for this conversation. We hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you.